Welcome to evaluating CCRS alignment of lessons, units, and resources on this bright, sunny Tuesday, at least in St. Paul. And I am so glad to have Christina Munzi joining us. Christine, go ahead. Thank you very much, Patsy. Hi, everybody. Yes, as Patsy said, it is um, my office. I have a large window that looks out, and I don't think anyone went to work or school today because everyone's out um, in the street with their dogs. Uh, so welcome to today's webinar. Um, I am uh, Christine Kelly. I am the Atlas Literacy Coordinator, and I'm here with Lindsay, who I will ask to introduce herself. Yes, I am Lindsay. I'm the Numeracy and Special Projects Coordinator with Atlas, and yeah, we're excited to be here. So we wanted to get, we want to know who's in the room. Um, so if you could share with us in the chat uh, how long you've been in ABE and your current role, and then just a yes or no after that. Um, I've gone through the CCRS implementation cohort. We have a about a nine month long uh, cohort uh, every other year that uh, programs will send teams through. So kind of a yes or no after your current role and how long you've been in ABE. Two years, okay. Chill, two years, getting your sea legs a little bit. Volunteer, I love, I love, love, love when I find out that people who um, started as volunteers in our programs then ended up um, uh, coming in and working. And Tracy, you, you're doing ABE by fire hose. <laughs> EFL or EL4. Okay, Doretta, four years as an ESL teacher. Great. Thank you for this. This is very helpful and it's fun to have such a mix in the room here today. Oh, I think Susan wins. Yep. <laughs> She she wins all of the prizes. Fifty one years, years teaching. Wow. And Thirty in ABE. Wow. Thank you for that. Wow. Yes. That is. Um. I I have been teaching. Wow. I've been teaching since ninety five. Started with high school, and then here I am. So I. I don't, I, I'm not the, the most. So thank you so much for sharing that. And um, you don't have to uh, have been through um, the cohort. Uh, this is a tool that we um, introduce in the cohort and we use there, but it is not something you need to be in the cohort to use. Um, and so um, we're excited to, to show it. I've also um, received uh, some emails asking, are we recording this? Because people would like to use this with their their professional learning communities or their staff to, um, it's a great tool to, especially to assess a resource if you're thinking of purchasing a resource. So uh, just very, very briefly today, um, I'm going to give a little bit of background about uh, about this tool. It's had a little bit of a history and it's been um, well informed by Minnesota uh, practitioners. Um, Lindsay's going to talk a little bit about, uh, just a little bit about culturally responsive teaching, which um, the newest um, uh, uh, iteration of this tool um, is, is focused uh, very much in that arena. We're going to look at the tool. Um, we are going to look specifically at the criterion that we worked on uh, updating this year. We're going to talk about some additional resources. And then we've got some great still, you know, we're only in April and we've still got some great PD events coming up and then answer any questions that you might have. So a little bit of background. So how far we've come with the tools, I'll let you know when to click. Thank you, Lindsay, for doing that. Well, way back in 2014, there was a team of us who went to Washington, D.C. to learn all about the college and career readiness standards for adults. Um, Patsy and I were both on that team, along with Astrid, our uh, state PD specialist, Brad Haskamp. Um, we had some uh, teachers uh, attend with us, and it was a mighty group. Um, and we were introduced to this very lengthy tool to, uh, to evaluate lessons and resources for CCRS alignment. It was very long. It was called the resource um, alignment tool, which we referred to as the rat. 
And I know uh, Patsy's listening and can chime in that it was a very, very long tool. There was a good reason it was called the rat. It was not beloved by Minnesota AV. <laughs> no, no, we, we looked at it and we said right away, if we're going to introduce a tool for this, we're going to shorten it and we're going to tighten it up because Minnesota teachers don't have time to go through, a, you know, a 12 page tool. So Lindsay, if you would click. We had our first iteration uh, in 2015, and that is when we started uh, piloting uh, our trainings with the uh, College and Career Readiness Standards. Um, so right away, we shortened um, this huge document. We added some more specific evidence criteria that we gleaned from additional resources um, that we got our hands on around the country as far as uh, criterion for looking at uh, particular ELA uh, uh, connections with the, the shifts and uh, with math um, shifts and practices. And we split it into two tools. We had the evaluation rating tool, which you just used to go through um, and uh, look to see how strong you see the connection uh, with the standards. And then we created a high value action tool, which is where you decided what what's the big bang for the buck uh, actions that you could take to really strengthen alignment. So we used that those two tools for a while. Next iteration. Then in 2021, uh, I give all the, the credit to Lindsay. Um, we were working uh, on some training and Lindsay decided that there's no reason this couldn't just be one tool. And so instead of two tools, she combined into the resource alignment and evaluation rating tools where the criteria and the high value actions uh, are, are on um, uh, the same document and it's linked to a notes page where um, you can take uh, or the, uh, the practitioner can take all kinds of notes uh, about um, what the strengths are, what maybe the weaknesses are, and what some of the, 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 the high value action actions might be. And then 2022, uh, due to uh, the, co the last cohort that we ran, which was a few years ago, we're running one right now, um, feedback. We, we got some excellent feedback from the participants in that cohort. And um, it was that we needed to bring in some more inclusivity uh, and learner centeredness into the tool. And really that was gonna fit in criterion four, which we're gonna talk about today, which is all about student support. And um, we decided to update the resource one more time. It's still one tool, but we really beefed up this one of four criterion um, to have uh, some indicators that can help us determine if the materials and the approaches that we're using with learners are um, inclusive. Anything to add, Lindsay? Yeah, uh, just one thing um, that Patsy is going to put links. Oh, she just did to the math and ELA tools. Um, before we move on, feel free to click on one or both, but you can choose which one. Um, and just so you have a visual of the tool, what we're talking about, um, this is on the Atlas uh, website. And so you will see that it will take you to an Atlas page and then you will have to click on open resource in order to see it. Um, but it's broken up by shifts and then criterion four, which is what we're going to talk about today, uh, thinking about the structure and the assessments and the support that we're providing students. Um, so they're structured the same, but obviously uh, some, some slight differences to tailor to ELA or math. But take a couple minutes to open one up, skim through it so you kind of see uh, what we're talking about. And then we will be focusing on that last criterion today. Okay, so the links are in the chat for the math and the ELA tool. Just go ahead and click. Uh, as Lindsay said, they're similar in many ways. We wanted that because we know that there are, you know, teams working together and whether you're working, you know, primarily in math or in ELA or, of course, doing both, um, there'd be a lot of common language um, uh, using these tools. So take a few minutes and look at one or the other or both. Maybe make it a little bigger, Lindsay. Thank you.
We're going to jump back in. Um, one thing I would like to to um, be clear about is the purpose of these tools isn't to decide like what are the resources I should keep and, and what are the resources that I shouldn't keep in my classroom. The, the the purpose of these is to determine you know what the strength is as far as how these the a particular lesson or resource incorporate um, the CCRS. Now you might determine that a, a resource or a lesson is not very strongly aligned and you may decide to use that resource or lesson in a different way, right? It just maybe it, 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 you have another purpose for it. Or you might look at it and go, you know, this is going to take a little work to strengthen some um, of the standards, but I'm going to identify two or three ways and I'm going to put that time in and then feel that, you know, I'm, I've got, I'm teaching a lesson or I'm teaching out of a resource, you know, that is, um, that is serving me well. That works really well in one room schoolhouses. If you can take an essential, like a core resource, maybe that you're using um, and, you know, and, and strengthen it to feel confident that when when you do copy things out or you do give students um, uh, parts of that resource, that the resource itself, you've got it in a really good place. So um, so really, it's, it's there's a lot of flexibility. So the next slide quickly. And one of the things that Lindsay and I really wanted to do with showing the different iterations was also to drive home that in Minnesota, we listen and we listen to feedback that practitioners have a great deal to say um, when it comes to the work that we're doing. And what informed our changes over time, uh, we've had a, a CCRS lead team, an initial one, and then it's changed over time. Participant feedback from all of the cohorts we've done uh, back to 2017, 2018. Um, the facilitator feedback from uh, people who facilitated uh, the cohort, ELA math, the admin um, section of the cohort. Advisory teams. Um, when we, when Lindsay and I were working on um, revising Criterion Four, um, we did bring in uh, the A team, which is the math, uh, the state math advisory team, uh, Latte, the literacy and language. Um, state advisory team. So we had ESL people, we had low level, we had high level, we had people in career pathways, we had people who, you know, one room schoolhouses only taught ELA, only taught math taught everything there is to teach, administrators. I mean, we, we had a lot of voices. And then finally, um, what informed our changes is just really a continued move towards strengthening and growing in our understanding of learner-centeredness and inclusivity um, in the classroom, both in our practices and in the materials that we're using. And finally, um, we, um, we, we do love to claim when things are on a national level and they come from Minnesota. And um, this is a great uh, checklist that Lindsay and I used in addition to some other resources. This is on the links uh, website. And this uh, was created uh, from work done by Betsy Parrish, our own Betsy Parrish. Um, and uh, she uh, did a blog for Cambridge um, that was placing learners at the center of teaching. Uh, notice the Brit spelling um, and just kind of a nice little checklist that really helped us um, do some revision of this criterion for so lots of voices involved in this. Uh, we do not sit in a vacuum. We are we are constantly looking for uh, um, for um, input from everyone around us. I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay, and she's going to talk a little bit about cultural responsiveness, which is kind of a a, a, a spot for her that she's quite has quite a lot of of love for. Go yeah, ahead. I just was like, oh, do I have it? So I don't know if anybody had this. Is I was not planning on doing this, but uh, where I am going to get uh, some of these ideas. Um, directly from Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain uh, by Zaretta Hammond. And so this book was, uh, yeah, trans transformative for me in many ways. Uh, it was around, I think, the start of the pandemic when I kind of picked it up and um, yeah, it, it really spoke to me. So, but we're also, uh, there. there's a large conversation happening around this book as well. There have been other workshops um, from different ABE practitioners um, and I know that it is uh, has been widely used, I believe, in K-12 um, in some schools. So uh, it is definitely a book that speaks on a lot of uh, important uh, ideas that we need to, to implement. So, but first, culturally responsive teaching, that term, 
this may seem like a buzzword. I feel like we hear it a lot. Um, you know, maybe it, maybe it doesn't, but maybe it does start to feel a little bit like some jargon or something like a fad, something that's uh, fashionable, but that's just going to kind of go away. So I'm curious if you'd be willing, like what words come to mind when you hear this term, culturally responsive teaching? I'll give you a moment to type in the chat. What words come to mind? A word for me that comes to mind is uh, equity. And then with that, a follow-up question in my mind is, but what do we mean by equity? I feel like equity is a term that um, needs a lot of unpacking because it, it encompasses so much, right? Um, Tracy says, working with learners from different cultures and adapting your teaching to their needs. Nice. Anything else? If you have things, please feel free to keep typing. Um, so it, oh, here we go. See, I moved on too quickly. Uh, using strategies that meet students where they live, providing, oh my gosh, my screen got covered up, providing mirrors. Oh, I like that. Uh, respect for people from other cultures. Yeah, and so it, uh, it, for me, it's kind of like, okay, yes, yes, I want to do that, but how? Because <laughs> um, I don't always know the how. And so, you know, it's this is much deeper than than a buzzword, although it can become that if uh, it just anything can become that, right? Um, but really, if we unpack it, it's about building authentic relationships with students, cultivating a welcoming classroom environment, uh, implementing strategies that foster student ownership of their own learning, establishing students as experts through student collaboration, and providing contextual learning through including multiple viewpoints and applications. And so all the ideas that you put in the chat about teaching to their needs and uh, meeting students where they live, providing mirrors, respect for people from other cultures, I think fit within that, um, uh, these principles and so, or these practices. So with the slides, I won't, we won't put it in the chat now, but with the, the slides there uh, at the bottom here, cause you will get a link to the slides uh, in a follow-up email uh, after today's webinar, there is a resource about these five kind of uh, breaking them down a little bit more. It is not a resource that we created. I've, uh, Christine found this resource. And so I am going to defer to her as to, uh, the exact source, um, but it is very practical, I think, and gives some suggestions for each of these five practices. And so that's kind of what we're talking about when we are um, thinking about culturally responsive teaching. And then I just want to share my own aha moment before we dive into Criterion 4. This is from the book that I shared. Um, this this was like page 14, so I barely made it even through the first chapter. And this is like, what? Uh, for me. So there was this grid or this table of the dependent learner and the independent learner. And as I looked, I was thinking, oh my gosh, I have so many learners here. And it's because unintentionally, that's how I was setting up um, my classroom. And, and I felt like I had very authentic relationships with my students, but there were some strategies that I was not implementing in order to help them um, become take take ownership of their learning. Um, and so this this was a turning point for me in my instruction. Um, I was in the classroom for about ten years. So the last couple of years of my instruction, I was trying to undo some things that I had been doing and 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 tweak my routines and and try to give more um more of the cognitive load share that with the students instead of me carrying it so so much because it wasn't helping uh this this quote stood out to me in the book as well when a teacher expresses sympathy over failure lavishes praise for completing a simple task or offers unsolicited help you send the unintended message of low expectations. And I so desperately wanted to help my students. I had students in very um, 
uh, challenging circumstances surrounding trying to come to school. And so I wanted it to be a safe place. And I, I think I just overdid, um, the help and, and it wasn't beneficial. So I wanted to share that with you and then leave you with this. So you may have, um, heard, uh, about the warm demander, read about it. Um, Zaretta Hammond talks about four different kind of teaching styles and then zeroes in on the warm demander as, hey, this is, th this encompasses um, like fostering independent learning where we are warm. Students know they can come to us. Uh, we are that safe place. We have that welcoming environment, those authentic relationships. We have that trust and rapport and we have high expectations and, and, and we're able to give tough love when we need it for the students good. Um, and so uh, there, there is a, a handout that uh, Patsy linked in the chat for your own reference um, sometime if you would like to look through that if you haven't seen it yet. Um, that also was very helpful for me to kind of put some more practical um, and tangible words to uh, what do I do? What do I change? How do I, where, where, what direction am I supposed to move if I do wanna be more culturally responsive in my teaching? So that's kind of the background because those principles you will see in um, the Criterion 4. And so we are going to go through um, the just the Criterion 4. So when you were looking at the math and the ELA tools, and they are linked here on the slides as well, um, but the full tools are here. But when you looked at them, you saw, okay, there were the three shifts, and then there was that Criterion 4 that both had. And so Christine and I are going to take some time to go through the criterion for and 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 look at those questions and um, the high value actions. And uh, as we go through this, if something comes to mind or you have a question or whatnot, please feel free to put that in the chat. Um, but we will uh, go through this and then give you a chance to reflect more deeply on this criterion. So the first question um, that we have um, is actually like what? One, two, three questions in one, um, but kind of asking similar questions in different ways. But do the tasks lend themselves in math to multiple solution methods? Do the tasks lend themselves to discussion? Do the tasks create an opportunity to engage students in productive struggle and elicit mathematical thinking from students? And I think this is really important in making math more accessible um, to more to everyone uh, because we all learn differently and we've been taught that there's one right way to do math maybe not all of us but a lot of the population has been taught that way and that's just not true there there are multiple ways that we can think about problems in order to arrive at the solution or a solution depending on the situation and so how do we present tasks so that they are more open for different kinds of thinking to come forth. Um, are the texts and problems worthy of our students' time and attention? Are they authentic? Um, what you were writing in the chat, like are they mirrors of what students would see um, and, and know, or are they, um, are they about contexts that have no meaning? Uh, or relevance to their their lives, their needs, their interests, interests, their experiences, and so kind of there, there's that question of thinking: Are these tasks relevant and authentic, um, and worth my students' time? I just literally like that um, that phrase: Is it worth my students' time and attention? Um, the third question that we can think about when looking at a task or a lesson or or units or a whole resource. Um, are the problems, tasks, texts, because uh, there are texts in numeracy, right? Numeracy, graphs, those are texts. Are they inclusive and representative of the identities and experiences of the learners you are working with? And that's going to be different for every class because every class we have different learners, different backgrounds, different identities. And so knowing our students, where those, like, those authentic relationships really come to, come to play because we have to have those relationships to know what kinds of tasks and work and materials are going to be um, representative of the population in front of us. Are there appropriate scaffolds, interventions, and supports identified to make content accessible to a broad range of learners? 
So an example would be digital resources. Um, are they accessible by screen readers or other tools? Um, thinking through how, how are people with different um, needs and abilities um, going to be able to access this content? Will the lesson provide observable evidence that a student can independently demonstrate the standard? Uh, do learners have choices for how to demonstrate their knowledge? Is student thinking, reasoning made visible? I love, uh, and maybe you are using these, I love choice boards. Um, I didn't use them in my instruction much, maybe a couple times, um, but lately now working with Christine, I am convinced that they are an amazing um, option to present to, to learners after a certain length of time of study um, and giving students choices for how to demonstrate knowledge. Maybe it's an oral presentation with a volunteer to, to talk through what their understanding is. Maybe it is writing a paragraph. Maybe it is creating one or two slides in Google Slides with graphics. You know, like what, how are you going to show that you understand this concept? Um, giving students choices, I think, can be, uh, again, accessible um, and, and culturally responsive. And, um, and then does the resource include a rubric, answer key, or sample learner responses to help interpret a student's understanding or misunderstanding of a concept? Um, being able to understand what students know and what students misunderstand, I think, is the misunderstanding is just as valuable. It highlights um, what my next move might be. So if we're looking at a whole resource, is there some resource here? Like, say I wanted to know, like, should I buy this book? Okay, these are some questions that I can ask to think through uh, what I might, uh, if this is, if I'm thinking that this is going to be worth me purchasing or our program purchasing. I may not be able to answer all of these questions for every resource in the way that I would like, in the perfect ideal way, um, because no resource is perfect. But these are some guiding questions to think through um, uh, to kind of know if it's worth purchasing and how much, if I am going to, how much uh, um, supplementing what I need to do. So those questions, again, evaluation. This is the evaluation piece of it. I'm asking, they're open-ended. I'm talking about it. I'm thinking about it. And then if I decide, yes, I'm going to use it, but I do want to strengthen it in some way, the tool gives you choices for how to take some high value actions. You don't choose all of these for every resource or every task or every lesson, but these are options. Okay, what? where do I want to strengthen it? And so some options, maybe uh, you could identify opportunities and resources for scaffolding differentiation, intervention, and support for all students, including those who are in need of additional support and those ready for extension activities. If that's where you decide that the resource or the task or lesson was weak, I wanna then make sure that I'm identifying opportunities where I'm going to provide those scaffolds and interventions. Another way um, of strengthening in this, um, in this area, if, if it seems appropriate, identifying content specific vocabulary and other language support needs and develop appropriate scaffolds. Encourage the use of learners first language, culture and methods of problem solving as resources for learning. This um, is very true um, in literacy classes and it's equally true in math classes. There is so much language in math. And so I, I really think encouraging the use of learners first language um, what what words mean in in their first language and making that connection because a lot of students who um, come from outside the U.S. a lot of students have had a lot of math and so sometimes it's more the language barrier than anything um, and there can be different ways of problem solving different ways of setting up division problems different ways of of different ways of writing decimals and um, uh, commas uh, where we use those with numbers and so. Knowing how we use it here will be important for for uh, communication in through tests or in school or whatnot. But making the connection that oh, you do know place values, you do know this, right? It's just a different way. So thinking through those things, developing standards aligned assessments, rubrics, and practices that measure a student's ability to demonstrate targeted standards without bias. 
Um, if there aren't rubrics, maybe consider making one and think through what implicit biases might I hold about students that I should be aware of and commit to dismantling? What implicit biases am I holding about what students are capable of or uh, what a right answer should look like? Um, kind of thinking through those um, as you're making the, the rubric and, and talking about it with someone else because sometimes we don't see um, our own. Uh, providing students choices for how to demonstrate their knowledge of the targeted standards. I mentioned choice boards. Uh, incorporate varied modes of curriculum embedded assessments that may include pre-assessments, formative assessments, summative and self-assessment measures. Um, so uh, maybe I want to add more of those assessments throughout as I'm using the resource I'm looking at. Um, I also love this providing opportunities for students to think metacognitively and have those strategies to reflect on their own progress towards the goals, their strengths and their areas for growth, and then like what to do next. Um, so if we're in, inviting students into that process, that's giving them some strategies for how to take ownership of their learning. And then I believe this is the last one, uh, provide context for learners. Um, career, community, academic subjects that are authentic and relevant to learners' needs, interests, experiences, cultures, and identities. So it's a lot of like lists, but I, I find it helpful to have questions for me to think through and then choices. Where could I strengthen to make this um, more accessible and responsive and reflective of the learners in front of me? So that's the math. I will turn it over to Christine and again, put questions in the chat as you have them, um, but I'll let her look at the ELA. Yes, and uh, this will be a little quicker to go through because um, there are many, many similarities uh, between the two tools. So, um, so again, uh, this idea of productive struggle and higher level thinking, um, but uh, you know, we focus a lot on text with um, ELA and um, do all students have the opportunity to engage with the complexity of the text? Now, how they may be scaffolded to engage with that complexity may be differentiated, but it's 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 something great to think of. Um, are the texts and problems, same as math, worthy of students' time and attention? And um, is there are they authentic? Um, is the content relevant to your students' goals and their interests um, and what they bring to the table? Again, tasks and uh, tests, text, sorry, and tasks inclusive and representative of the identities and experiences of our learners so that they feel included. Appropriate scaffolds, and not only do we have appropriate scaffolds, interventions, and support. Sports, um, to create access for students, but we also remember to gradually remove those scaffolds, um, leading students to be able to do more and more independently. And again, this idea of observable evidence um, that students can do something independently at some point. Do they have choices? Lindsay was talking about, you know, the choice boards. Choice boards can have six choices. They can have two choices. Um, is student thinking or reasoning made visible? And again, for all students, so sometimes we have very quiet students who don't necessarily engage, we want to make sure that we're providing opportunities either for them in the chat box or in pairs or, you know, in some writing where they can participate as well. And finally, again, as Lindsay was talking about with math, including rubric, answer key, sample learner responses, we want students to know what we expect. We want to be able to help them see what success means. Um, and so it's important to have that piece. Some high value actions we can take uh, for ELA. And the expectation is never that you take all of these high value actions, but these are kind of really, um, big ones that can create uh, a large impact. So again, identify where uh, that scaffolding differentiation intervention support needs to happen for all students um, uh, from the very, the, from the lower end of your class to all the way to the highest end of your class. Another high value action 
um, is to provide evidence-based reading support uh, uh, resources to support students who need more time and attention. When it comes to reading, there are multiple components of reading and some students, the support might mean that they need to do some extra work in decoding with phonemic awareness, fluency. Fluency is often uh, something that creeps in even to the GED classroom or extra support for vocabulary acquisition. Uh, again, provide students some choices so that they have, yes, there are times when I would prepare my students for the GED, yes, they all were going to have to write an argument analysis essay, and they weren't going to be given choices in how to do that on the GED, but throughout the learning process, giving them different ways to demonstrate their understanding of, say, what makes an effective argument. And again, develop those clear uh, standards aligned assessments, rubrics, and practices um, so that um, um, we can assess students' ability um, without bias. Couple more. We want to incorporate all kinds of embedded assessments so they can be, you know, if we want to assess what their background knowledge is before assuming that they don't have background knowledge in a specific uh, um, content area, formative assessment, easy. Put your thumb up if you're doing okay. Put it here if you're doing, you know, if you're not sure, down if you need more help, all the way to, you know, quizzes, self-assessment, you know, giving them an opportunity. How did you, you know, how do you feel you did with your group, with the group task? What is something you did well working with a group? What is something you'd like to do next time working with a group? Provide opportunities for students to think. It's kind of what I was just saying, getting them to think about their um, interaction in the class. Uh, we want them, we talk about how we can see when they're making progress. If I ask a student, if, if he or she or they're making progress, can the student articulate the sense of progress that they're making? So we want to make sure that students kind of are tracking their own growth and using strategies in gaining self-efficacy, in gaining um, knowledge in a content area. And provide context for learners. We, you know, we, we want things to be connected to their goals. We want things to be connected. Not everything we're going to do is going to be the most interesting to students. We can't always, um, there, are, there are times where we have to, you know, expose them to content that maybe they're not as excited about, but we need to really work to continue to draw those connections and create a rationale that clearly connects what we're doing to the student goals. All right. So we have a little self-assessment and I think we might just be able to do, do we wanna just do pairs, um, Lindsay, we, uh, or just one group? Uh, good question. Let's do, um, let's do one group. Um, so you will get into a breakout group where we're not there and you don't have to, yeah, I don't know, sometimes when presenters are present, it's awkward. So you will have time to talk about this uh, self-assessment. First, we want you to um, take five minutes and think about the items on this checklist, but reflect on them in terms of um, a recent lesson that you taught, um, your instruction in general, or um, if uh, or if you're in a, a different role and, and not an instructor, uh, what you encourage uh, your instructors to do or in your program values that you have, right? And so thinking through uh, these items. So this will not be turned in. No one's going to look at your exact answers. We just want to give you a few minutes to reflect, and then we're going to give you a chance to uh, talk about uh, this tool, these kinds of questions uh, with each other after that. So I think the link, there we go, is in the chat. Thank you, Patsy. And when you click on it, it should be, yes, it is a PDF. So you can think through these. And what would I check for my own instruction or my program or when I'm coaching teachers? And, and we created these 
from both the math and the ELA tools. So they're applicable to both. And we did give um, a few more examples in this. So for example, um, where it says um, that they are, um, let's see, where was it? I, I thought, oh yeah, I added, so for example, appropriate scaffolds, interventions, and supports. And one of that I identified was, um, it, it, it also may include learners using their first language and culture as resources for learning. That is an appropriate scaffold at times. So um, sometimes we added a little a little bit more, but basically it's, it's this is something that no matter what content or level um, could be used for self-assessment. So we'll take like three minutes. I'll move this timer. Take like three minutes to look at it. And then we will put you in groups to discuss what you're noticing and wondering. All right. So we want to give you time to talk. Um, and these are some questions and I'm going to actually project this slide to the breakout room. Um, so you'll see these questions in front of you. Uh, and the, the questions to think about, uh, you can introduce yourself if you don't know each other already, but then what resonated with you as you went through the criterion four questions and high value actions when we went through that uh, together. And then what did you notice? What did you wonder when you went through that assessment, right? Um, just so about the tool in general, what did you notice? What did you wonder? What resonated? We'll take about 10 minutes, eight minutes, plus a two minute countdown. You don't have to come back right away, um, but you will have that two minute warning to wrap up your conversation. All right, I'll go ahead and open the room.
All right. I hope uh, that that was a helpful conversation. We would love to hear. Uh, you can feel free to unmute and share. Like, what did you talk about? Or if you haven't used this tool, how might it benefit you? How might you use it? And if you have used this tool before, how would you plan to use Criterion 4? So any or all of those questions, anybody willing to share and come off mute? I think one of the ways that it's most helpful for me is that I still get caught wanting to teach the same way that I was taught or that I enjoy being taught. <laughs> and using that helps me think about I am not every student. I do not think like every student. And it's just full of reminders for me of am I really reaching every student? It helps me think about individual students in my classroom and think, oh, nope, that one does better with group work. Nope, that one needs more visuals. No, nope. you know, it really helps me just focus in on my students. I love that. And I am guilty of that as well. I, my default, how I learn and how I was taught. <laughs> so, yeah. And again, I think that the goal is, you know, it's tough. And especially if you're in a classroom with multiple students and you are doing the one room schoolhouse, right. But it's just baby steps. It's like, what is, what is, you know, one thing I can do, um, you know, on this list just to, you know, get a little bit more, you know, even learner centered. I said for years, oh, I'm all about student centeredness. And then I had, um, I had a peer come into my classroom and I said, I just want you to listen to about how much teacher talk there is opposed to student talk. Well, guess what? There was <laughs> plenty of talk coming from me and I'm like, oh, <laughs> and so, um, and just so even just being aware of times when maybe I would tell students something and instead asking them or asking them to um, kind of lead the review of, a, you know, a concept or something, that was a small thing that made a big deal. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Anybody else want to share? Well, I'm relatively new to ABE. I used to be in hospital administration for many years. And then I decided I've had enough administration. And so I got my um, substitute teaching license. And now I have, I have tier two license for ABE. Uh, and I use Burlington. Uh, pre, you know, and I teach level six. And like I was sharing in the break room, I have like 24 students, level six. And even within, you know, one level, there are different levels. Oh, yeah. And I have students from so many different countries. So it's a very rich experience to, you know, like we were just talking about um, um, technology and employment and talk about robots. And my student from Vietnam said, oh, yeah, we have them over there, you know, in the restaurants. So they were sharing about their experience with robots, you know, so it's it's very, very good. But like I said, I have not used this um, format because Burlington is so comprehensive. It's got everything in there. So that's that's my experience. Right. And you may. Yeah. And you may you may um, already be doing things right. I've seen Burlington used um, in classrooms where. Um, where the teacher has com just completely relied, you know, on Burlington um, and um, to, to different effects. So sometimes I notice when teachers say, no, I'm using this, you're using it as a core, but I bet you're, you're, you're doing all kinds of things with it, right? So that you're, oh, yes. you're making sure to do it. Yeah. And it, sometimes it just comes naturally. We don't even notice it. And thank you for moving over from hospital administration into adult ed. I mean, I think what we find that People who've had previous careers often come in and bring just a wealth of um, a wealth of expertise that's really applicable. <laughs> that's what I hear people say, you know, Doretta, you come with no <laughs> preconceived ideas. You know, it's all new. So anyway, and I ask questions. Which is so good. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I feel the same way coming in, coming in and having it be all new because I was a Spanish teacher for four years before staying home with my kids for 22 years. And I just taking all these credits to get my teaching license back, finally got that back. 
um, just started teaching a few weeks ago. So I feel like it's a lot to learn, but I feel like it's a good time to get into it because there's so much that's been done. And now I just have to learn what's been done in order to apply it to um, my little baby teaching that I'm trying to do. So <laughs> Um, getting there and this sort of thing is very useful, this kind of a tool, which of course I haven't used yet, but now I can try to think about it as I'm coming. I we use Burlington English too, but I do add my own things to it. Um, it's a great core. There's no doubt about that. Right. And we're a one-room schoolhouse. I'm going to be the teacher of the ESL class. That's our only large, huge group one at nighttime. So trying to work with that and then also trying to meet the different levels is it's a big challenge, but I think it's it's also really cool because the people that we work with, the learners are all very pretty awesome people. So I think the best one of the best things I've ever heard somebody say is when we were talking about, well, you know, you have, you know, oh, you have a leveled class. You know, some some programs will say we have because because the costest level, you know, is between a 200 and a 220, you know, whatever. And somebody once said to me, if you have more than one student in your classroom, you have a multi-level class. Yeah. <laughs> and it's so true. Uh -huh. It's true. And they all have background knowledge in different areas. Maybe they've had some have had professions, some haven't even oh, yeah. had much school, but yeah. Any I like what you said there. Thank you for sharing. Any other comments before we move along? We we have space for this. So if you have something else you want to share, please do. Or even just one thing that kind of jumped off that self-assessment where you thought, you know what? I'm going to go in next week and I'm going to think about this more. I think it'll be a good tool. Um, as as I said before, I got I was contacted uh, before the webinar by a program here in the metro that um, they're they're familiar with the tool. The person's in the cohort, but um, wants to do more of this work um, at a staff meeting, um, and and that can be a great you know a, a self assessment like this, like a professional learning community, or you know teachers can be talking. Um, you know, even um, even I love peer observation. You know, and even you know asking peers. You know, I'm really thinking about you know a couple things here, and can you can you come in and just kind of see how how it's going? I've done that before, um, um, and again, a lot of times I, I feel like. Um, I've been observing teachers uh, for a program in Colorado, virtual, and some of them are like, oh, I'm so afraid to be observed. And I'm like, but you're just awesome. Like, don't be afraid. <laughs> so. Like the tasks lending themselves to discussion. And it's like, you want things to bring up other topics, especially when I'm working with the ESL learners, but then you get on tangents and you have to kind of wrap it around and bring it back. So you don't just consistently go off on tangents, but to have things that lead to discussions, I think that's a cool idea. So many different things here though. Yeah, one, um, I resonate with what you said, Tracy. <laughs> and another one that stands out to me that I've been thinking about, um, are texts and problems worthy of your worthy of your students time and attention authentic and relevant so mm -hmm. this is this idea of real world math problems i my thinking has really been challenged and i won't go off on a whole spiel cuz i could but just like what is real world math like is it a how fast can i drink a milkshake problem like milkshakes are real life so there you go. Like it's real life, you know, but no one really cares about how fast you can drink a milkshake. But what if we talk about, um, um, and I got this from a book uh, that I'll tell you in about in a minute, but like, what if we instead talked about how cities raise revenues, revenue, and like, maybe there's a, a an algebraic expression or equation we could write that that uh, talks about that instead of the rate that I'm drinking a milkshake. 
how we are how how cities uh, give out speeding tickets and then late fines on top of it. How long would it take someone to pay that off? You know, if they had if they paid the minimum payment every month, et cetera. Like that is more, I think, relevant. Not you know just because of that's something that we all deal with. We can all get a speeding ticket at some point, right? And um, and then you can have a rich conversation about, is this a way that that city should rely on to raise revenue or not? And there can be different opinions, et cetera. Um, so just talking about those, like what does authentic math actually mean? Um, and a book that's challenged me is Dear Citizen Math by Kareem Ani. So I'll put that in the chat um, for anybody who's interested, but it, it highlighted authentic to me, what actually is authentic and simultaneously showed me the connection between math and ELA and social studies and science, because these topics to actually discuss them require knowledge and, and skills in all of those content areas. So. Well, and I um I can give you an example of when um, we started, when we kind of presented th these these criteria to um, the latte team, the language and literacy advisory team. One of the um, the teachers um, who was on the language and literacy advisory team, she was working through criterion four and she stopped and she said, oh boy. And I said, what? And she said, well, this was when Queen Elizabeth died. And she said, I just used an article about Queen Elizabeth dying and how the world was mourning and all of this. And um, she said, you know, one of the things she realized is, um, not to like not use it, but she's she had a, a classroom full of students, many who came from colonized countries by Britain. And she said, you know, when she was thinking about the, you know, being inclusive and representative, she said that what she realized is it would have been a great opportunity then to ask her students, you know, there's a point of view in the article about how, you know, people were so sad, but inviting students based on your experience, you know, and where you're from, um, what are some, what is your point of view or is your point of view similar? Is it different? What about the people uh, from where you live? And then giving students an opportunity to add kind of their own point of view or their own narrative. It, it's such a small thing, but then all of a sudden students were recognizing that our students have had different experiences and may see things differently. And to not, not use the article, but then just to be aware of how to get students in um, and being able to connect to it in their own ways. Mm -hmm. And um, I, we have a slide shortly that we will show you uh, with some upcoming PD, but one of them is Math Institute and Math Institute this year is at the end of September. So it's a long way away. We can plan for it um, now and request it off. Uh, but I um, am really excited. We are going to have um, someone that works closely with Kareem Ani, Heather Buzkirk, uh, she is developing uh, a workshop and keynote for us around this idea of what is authentic math and why does it matter and which lends itself to being incorporated into different subjects um, and is going to give us time to kind of engage with a question uh, that is meaningful that we can use in our classes. And so um, she works with Citizen Math which is an, it used to be Mathalicious, uh, which is an organization that Kareem Ani, I believe he's the founder of, um, or part of co-founder. Um, and they have some lessons, they have a curriculum, um, but they also have a sampling of free lessons as well. And so, um, but just that idea of what is authentic math and, and his claim is like, wow, where are we going to have these really hard questions they belong in the classroom they don't belong like oh it's too sensitive we can't talk about it. it's like oh let's do that let's teach students how to think critically and reason and they're already thinking about these things anyway because it's real life you know so uh that was a tangent but also a plug for math institute um and coming back to what's relevant and again it could change depending on um who the learners are that are sitting directly in front of us, right? We all may have slightly different answers to that question. Okay, I am going to turn it over to Christine to share a little bit about what other resources you can find on the Atlas website around CCRS. Um, would you like me to stop sharing, Christine? Or I can just take you over. Oh yeah, that's right, you can do that. <laughs> 
Okay, so yeah, I just want to talk a little bit. Um, we have some great, um, uh, um, great tools that have already been filled out. And even though this was prior to when we revamped with the uh, turning things into one tool and also um, kind of uh, beefing up that criterion for, there's still some really useful um useful reviews um, on this on our atlas website and so if you go to the atlas website um, you can click on resources and resources this will show all the different uh, libraries that we have we do a little bit of everything at atlas <laughs> as you can see but if you go to ccrs standards and then um, you go to thank you patsy for putting that link in and you can see here to the right, uh, it's a CCR standards, uh, ELA resources, math resources, general resources. And if we click, for example, on ELA resources, we go down to sample ELA resource evaluations. These were resource evaluations that were done in the cohort um, as, as assignments. And so um, we've got different uh, different uh, entire resources that have been done here, uh, uh, different texts, Common Core, Grammar and Beyond, Great Writing, New ZLA, the website, uh, Score Boost, Six Way Paragraphs, you know, Standout. Some of these are the Ventures books for those of you using Ventures, the USA Learns course, where these are like evaluations of the standards. Um, uh, the strength of the standards in these and suggestions for high value actions. Uh, no one has done Burlington English. I think that might be because Burlington English is so huge, but it would be a great thing uh, for someone to do. And also if we go down to math resources and we go to sample math resource evaluations, um, we can see here achieving tape success, breakthrough to math, again, common core achieve, uh, different things, algebra, GED test strategies, math sense, number power, um, uh, different preparation books for math. So there are some things that already are there. And even though they use the former iterations of the tools um, are, are really nice um, if you happen to be looking to use another resource uh, or it is a resource that you do use or you have in your program and you want to see kind of how it, how it sits up against the standards. Anything, um, Lindsay, more about the, the math? No, I think that covers it. Thank you. All right. Well, um, I do also want to talk briefly here about um, uh, the fact that we have using the new tool uh, this year for the cohort, we have some newer uh, evaluations using the, the tool that you've been seeing today. And one of them um, is Common Lit. If you've ever used Common Lit, that's a very large platform uh, that's basically meant for students with a third grade reading level and above. And um, this resource, I'm gonna talk about this just for a minute and then uh, um, Lindsay's gonna talk just very quickly about uh, a very widely used resource uh, for math. But um, this is how it looks. The note sheet is connected. It's linked to the uh, the sheet with the high value actions and the criterion. And it, you know, for some, for a teacher who was thinking of using Common Lit, it really goes through and it says we need some modifications on text complexity. There's definitely some strengths, but you know, vocabulary isn't. Um, students don't interact a lot with vocabulary. Um, the evidence. Modifications are necessary. There's lots of text dependent questions. There's academic speaking and listening, um, some writing instruction, but uh, teachers need to do a little work to determine what other areas of complexity students are gonna run into on the text. Uh, for knowledge, strongly aligned. Uh, Common Lit, like some of the other platforms like New ZLA and ReadWorks, does recommend text sets or paired text. Students can build knowledge in different academic areas. Um, but if um, there, there aren't essential questions, there aren't anything to kind of pull things together. So that might be a high value action. And then for that criterion four, lots of features to help students of different skill levels navigate. Um, there's lots of representation of different cultures, uh, different um, 
different uh, uh, groups of people. Um, and there is a, a 360 curriculum that's really laid out well, that is, is very strongly aligned to the standards, actually. Lots of rubrics and things, but students might need more support on some of those reading components um, and more formative or summative assessment. So this is how it works, uh, for example, for something like Common Lit. This is something that a teacher did and went through so that other teachers could look and go, hey, Hey, I, I think I am willing to do some of this work, or maybe I'm going to keep looking for a platform. Lindsay, you want to talk a little bit, take over a little bit about the Kaplan? Yes, let me find all my settings here. Okay, um, so has anybody used Kaplan or know of someone that uses Kaplan? It's a big, thick GED prep book. They have other prep books as well, not just GED, but I'm referring to the GED one. I think they have a high set one and um but anyways it's it has it addresses all five four subjects um in one book and so it's it's meant as like a review. Uh it doesn't spend too much time on one concept um because it is a prep book for a test. So um, some comments here. Um, I it, this is a big book, big book, literally, but also popular book is what I meant to say. It's a go-to book for a lot of programs, and so um, uh, I I actually did this uh, evaluation because I wanted to go through it with the lens of the tool and provide some ideas for supplements. Um, it has its place. It has a purpose for, for uh, helping students prepare for the exam. It is not a good um, curriculum uh, to take and just hand to students, especially if they're not at that GED prep level. So giving some comments about focusing, how do I focus the content? Um, that's one of the math shifts. Um, instead of a surface level understanding of a bunch, like how do I go deep with some concepts. And so giving some, some ideas um, for how to supplement that and, and maybe some routine ideas to help with that because the math concepts do go so quickly um, and how to incorporate math a math practice routine um, because the math practices aren't really addressed. Um, for the second shift of rigor, giving some feedback like, yes, there are adequate opportunities for developing that procedural skill and fluency um, in many of the lessons, um, de again, depending on the level and the amount that you need, but there are several lessons that have a lot of problems. However, there's not a lot that really dive, not a lot of questions that dive into conceptual understanding and, and having questions. It wasn't a book designed to do that. Um, and so if I'm gonna use it, maybe I consider adding some of those high level discussion questions um, with the lessons that I'm having students uh, work through or an activity where students have to explore. If they're working through this on their own and it's a one room schoolhouse, I'm not doing a, a big class uh, lesson, then how am I gonna help students individually engage with questions beyond what's on the page? Um, coherence, the third uh, shift and um, there's a little bit of a progression of ideas uh, leading from one to the next. There's not a lot of, as far as the table of contents, how it's laid out, there's not a lot of um, uh, explicit connections that, that the book tries to make between uh, concepts. And again, it was designed as a prep book kind of review before going and taking the test. So as a teacher, I would need to know, I, I might wanna add some of those um, prompts to help students think, well, what math do I already know that could be useful here and, and help students make those connections? And then uh, in this criterion four, I actually said it was weakly aligned. Um, and because the tasks in and of themselves, they don't really lend themselves to multiple solution methods or discussion. They are worthy of students' time and attention, the problems in the sense that it is a HSE prep um, book. And so if that's my goal, then these are definitely worth my time and attention. If that's not my goal, then I would choose a different resource uh, to work with students. Um, and you know, they're not very inclusive or representative of different identities, et cetera. So I do, I did make a couple uh, suggestions 
um, for how to uh, supplement and, and make uh, and add some problems with whatever concept we're working on in the book. Okay, let's let's see if we can add uh, some tasks that are more open that allow for for me to bring some reasoning and and, uh, and approach the problem in different ways uh, that I might really relate to, um, et cetera. So just giving some ideas there. Um, so again, not that this is a bad book, uh, but it has a purpose. And knowing how I might need to supplement to be more CCRS aligned if I am going to rely on a book like this uh, for my core text in my class, um, it, it's nice to have some some notes. Um, and and others might add additional notes or swap out some of my notes. Um, but this is this is kind of my thought process as I was looking through, and I found it very helpful for myself because I used Kaplan. Um, I supplemented a lot. Um, but it was helpful for me, even though I had used it so much, to go through this process and really critically think through those questions and each of the criteria, each of the criterion, where does this book land? How would I actually rate this? Um, and I surprisingly found a few more positives than I thought I would, um, but was able to think through some concrete ways of supplementing. So it was helpful. Those are linked here. They are not on our website yet. Uh, they Those were done very recently, I believe. Um, so I know the math one for sure is not up on our website yet, but it will be. Uh, but they're linked in the slides that you will get. Um, and uh, we just wanted to end with, I'm going to actually reverse the order of these slides. Like up next, uh, what's coming up, spring conference that is only, what, two and a half weeks away now, April 28th. Uh, on our website, you are able to register for that event. It is virtual and all-day conference uh, in lieu of in-person regionals um, that we hold in the fall. We will have this all-state spring uh, conference virtually, so you can join from wherever you'd like to. Um, there will be uh, different sessions, uh, numeracy, literacy, ESL, uh, ELA, uh, equity, uh, ones geared towards administrators, like there will be a, a sampling of, of different um, uh, sessions there that you won't want to miss out on and some coffee breaks where you can just kind of talk with some colleagues about about certain uh, topics. And then we have Summer Institute coming up, which is an in person conference. Uh, it is in Duluth. I forgot to put that on there. I apologize. Uh, there are some pre-conferences, August 15th and 16th. Um, and so there will be CCRS foundations for both ELA and math, um, and then an ABE foundations uh, in person. And so though there are three different pre-conferences pre -conferences to choose from if you um, haven't gone through one of those and you would like to. And then the regular conference um, will be uh, August 16th through the 18th. Um, again, it is up. Did I say Duluth? It's in St. Cloud, Wake Park area, right? We are usually in St. Cloud, but now it's at a slightly different location than we... Yeah, Summer Institute is in St. Cloud. That's right. It is in St. Cloud still. Yeah, it's close. It's not far from the previous oh. one. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'm thinking <laughs> of something else right now. Uh, and then uh, Math Institute, like I said, it's virtual. Uh, September 29th, it will be an all-day uh, conference, and we will have Heather Buzzkirk from Citizen Math uh, leading the morning workshops, and then we will have some concurrent sessions to choose from in the afternoon. So that's kind of a save the date for now, um, but registration for the Spring Conference and Summer Institute are both up. Um, awesome. So we... Uh, have a couple minutes left. If you have any questions, please feel free to unmute. We will be sending a follow-up email. Uh, you'll receive that from Gail Rutan, our senior events manager, with a link to the slides, um, an evaluation, and embedded in the evaluation, uh, you'll be able to then download your CEUs for attending today, um, and a link to the recording from today. So you'll get that in a follow-up email. But otherwise, feel free to stick around if you have questions. Thank you so much for being here. Thank, Thank you, everybody. I'll close the recording, but we won't go away quite yet. Get out and hopefully maybe enjoy a nice walk. <laughs>